syndrome that you, you may know. It's a facial syndrome and an abnormality of the pinky, the fifth digit, uh, as well as uh, persistent ductus arteriosus. It's, uh, it's due to, the, to a, a DNA binding protein, TFAP2 uh, beta, uh, which is mutated in Char syndrome. There are a couple of other genes that have been associated with it. One is uh, myosin heavy chain 11, which is a smooth muscle myosin heavy chain. Uh, this is not cardiac muscle. It, it's smooth muscle myosin heavy chain. Uh, and, of course, it's smooth muscle in the ductus that affects its closure. So it's not too surprising that a smooth muscle myosin uh, found in uh, vascular smooth muscle might be associated with it. And this syndrome uh, has been reported in a couple of uh, French uh, and French-Canadian families. Um, it's also associated with uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, probably also because of the myosin uh, in smooth muscle in the aortic media is abnormal as well. So there is a syndrome of that. And then myocardin has recently been, uh, myocardin is a transcription factor that largely is uh, expressed in cardiac muscle and in uh, vascular smooth muscle and is um, largely responsible for normal expression of uh, alpha smooth muscle actin and some of, the myos some of the other contractile elements in smooth muscle. And that's been shown, at least in an animal model, to be associated with persistence of the ductus, particularly uh, abnormal expression of myocardin and uh, neural crest cells, which make up most of the smooth muscle in the uh, various uh, aortic arches. And then there are premature infants, which uh, I'm not really going to talk about. But you can see uh, that uh, really a ductus is uh, a left or right shunt at arterial level in most uh, individuals. Uh, if there's pulmonary hypertension or uh, abnormal uh, pulmonary vasculature for one reason or another, uh, there can be right to left shunting. Or if there is uh, systemic outflow obstruction, there can be right to left shunting through the ductus as well. But most of what we're talking about in isolated ducts is just a left or right shunt. Uh, depending on the size of the ductus, uh, there can be heart failure or not, uh, and there can be pulmonary hypertension develop if the ductus is relatively large and it persists for some time. So those are the, the main issues here. And we'll look at a couple of examples of a ductus. Here's a small one. Uh, and we're looking at the aortic arch here. Here you can see the brachiocephalic artery. This is the subclavian and the carotid there on the uh, right, here's the left carotid and left subclavian. And of course, the ductus is going to be just distal uh, to the left subclavian artery. And here's our ductus coming from the pulmonary trunk here. <clears throat> There's the, the pulmonary trunk open. Uh, and you can see inside here, this is the ostium uh, of the ductus. And this is quite a small duct, only uh, a millimeter or two uh, in diameter here. And we can see the orifice of it there. The branch pulmonary arteries are down here. And then if we look from the aortic side, you can again see uh, the uh, ostium of the ductus. And here's the small ductus here between the aortic arch above and the pulmonary artery below. This is a left ductus and a left aortic arch. And usually it joins the base uh, of the left pulmonary artery. This is a, an example of a closed ductus, a ligament. What happens to the ductus normally when it closes? Uh, here we can see the aorta again, uh, up into the uh, aortic arch and proximal descending aorta, the pulmonary trunk down here. And this is the ligament, the closed ductus arteriosus. Uh, the smooth muscle in it constricts uh, and uh, basically uh, obliterates the vasculature, the vasovasorum that supply the ductus, and it infarcts and thromboses. And, uh, closes and forms a, a little uh, vascular strand. But often there persists uh, an ampulla, either in the aorta or pulmonary artery or both, and you can see the aortic ampulla there. Here's the, uh, the little uh, uh, ligament here. Uh, the ampulla, if it's large, can be a nidus for thrombosis, uh, occasionally can uh, be associated with uh, an embolic event. And this is uh, an example of a ductus that... Uh, was large and persisted into uh, adulthood. This is a, a large heart. This patient was uh, a young adult uh, at the time of death. And here you can see the brachiocephalic carotid and subclavian arteries up here. And then <clears throat> here's a large ductus. You can see that it's uh, nearly the size of the transverse arch. Uh, 
Uh, and here you can see from inside uh, that it's, it's, it's a, a large orifice up here uh, going up into the aorta. And here's the, the descending aorta down here, the isthmus, uh, and the large ductus coming into the descending aorta. This is the opened right ventricle, and you can see how thick the right ventricular wall is here. This patient had uh, systemic pressure uh, in the pulmonary artery and right ventricle. The left ventricle is somewhat dilated here, and there's some uh, evidence of endocardial fibrosis. You see the whitening and thickening of the endocardium here on the left side. All of these are, are possible changes uh, with uh, ductus arteriosus. And this is an example of a ductus with uh, retrograde flow uh, in the case of pulmonary atresia. This is a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot and pulmonary atresia whose source was this uh, ductus. This is the pulmonary trunk here coming down to a blind ending uh, as it approaches the heart. Here's the right pulmonary artery, uh, and here's the left, and then this is the ductus uh, over here as it comes down. That's the right where the probe is now. And the ductus is this part here. Uh, it's tortuous and often S-shaped or siphon-shaped as it comes from uh, the aorta down into the uh, pulmonary artery here. So this was a, a left arch and a, a left ductus. You can also have a, a right ductus, even uh, this is, happens to be in a right arch. Um, right du usually in a right arch there's a, a left ductus, but in this case there's a, a, a right ductus. Here you can see the uh, brachycephalix, and here's the aortic arch up here. Uh, and this is the, the origin of the ductus here, coming down uh, like this. And here's the right pulmonary artery on this side. This is the ductus here, coming down into the right pulmonary artery, right there. Treatment options include uh, device closure with a number of devices that have been used to, to close the ductus, coils, uh, coil in a bag and uh, the uh, Amplatzer type devices that have been used. Here you can see an example of a catheter across a ductus uh, about to put a device into the ductus. Uh, thoracoscopic treatment of the ductus has also been undertaken in a number of uh, cases. Here you can see the pulmonary artery, the ductus, and the descending aorta uh, in a thoracoscopic view. This is using the thoracoscope to look inside. And here you can see the clip in the clip applier about to be placed uh, on the ductus arteriosus. And this was a transesophageal echocardiogram showing flow from the descending aorta into the ductus that stops uh, as soon as the clip is applied. So it's possible to use this uh, to uh, evaluate the um, completeness of closure of the ductus. And this is just a comparison of um, surgery, uh, VATS, uh, or uh, endoscopy. Uh, endoscopic uh, closure of the ductus and Amplatzer device closure, and you can see that uh, virtually all of these, this closure was uh, the Chicago group, Gus Mavrudis' group. Uh, they had more than a thousand patients. They were all divided and ligated, zero mortality and about a 4.4% morbidity. Uh, <clears throat> for VATS, very similar, 99.4% closure, no mortality, and a, a slightly higher uh, morbidity. Uh, most of these were having to convert to a thoracotomy uh, because they were unable to completely close the, the device with uh, the thoracoscope and a clip. And then Amplatzer devices, this was the Amplatzer trial that was published, uh, again showing essentially 98% closure, no mortality, and 2.9% uh, um, associated morbidity. So that's our introduction to ductus. And I think uh, Dr. Rudolph is going to talk more about, is that right, or you, Norman? Ah, okay, so it's easier. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 that's a good idea. Hey. It's right here, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and there's the, Yeah.
Dr. Silverman put my talks on his computer to save time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Okay. Click this or that's one of those two. Hmm? Click uh, this or move this one? forward. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, as you know, in the fetus, the ductus transports poorly oxygenated blood in the, from the right heart across into the descending aorta and is directed to the placenta where oxygenation occurs. Now, a, a lot of our concepts of the uh, fetal circulation are based on the work that has been done in sheep. And what I want to really impress on you today, particularly with regard to the ductus uh, and other aspects of the circulation, in the human fetus, the, the volumes of blood passing through different vessels are very different in many ways from in the sheep. And I've just put in some of the main things here to point this out, and that is that in the uh, human fetus, these are the ones in red, you see that there's a much lower amount of blood ejected by the right ventricle. This, these are percentages of total output of the two ventricles. And you see that the left ventricle ejects a lot more in the sheep. About two-thirds of blood is put out by the right ventricle. In the human, it's a little more than a half. You see also that the pulmonary blood flow in the human is much higher as a proportion of cardiac output, 25% as compared to the sheep, which is only 7%. And then when we look at the ductus, you see that in the sheep, Almost about 60% of the total output of the heart goes through the ductus, but in the human, only 30%, half of that goes through the ductus. So, in other words, in the human, the ductus arteriosus is a much smaller structure than it is in the sheep. And a lot of our concepts of the importance of the ductus have been based on sheep work. You see, one of the reasons for the big difference is the fact that the blood flow to the placenta, umbilical blood flow in the sheep is a much higher percentage of cardiac output than it is in the human. And this, of course, influences the, the, venous, the, the umbilical venous return, which is much lower in the human than it is in the sheep. Now, the ductus is very much influenced by patterns of blood flow in the fetus. Now, in the normal... Uh, fetus, blood flow, as I said, is predominantly from the pulmonary artery through the ductus to the descending aorta. So that the, the, the orientation of the ductus is, has an oblique inferior angle where it joins the aorta. Now, when you see what happens with aortic atresia, the pattern of blood flow is the same. That blood, all the blood from the pulmonary artery actually goes through the ductus and the, partly to the descending, partly to the ascending aorta, but the pattern of flow is predominantly down to the descending aorta, so again there's an oblique inferior angle with the aorta. But when you look at a, a fetus with aortic atresia, there is no blood going into the pulmonary <coughs> artery so that the blood, pulmonary blood flow in the fetus, as well as postnatally, has to come through the ductus into the uh, pulmonary arteries. And in these fetuses, especially when the pulmonary atresia originates early in gestation, in these fetuses, the ductus arteriosus is small and it has an acute inferior angle with the 
descending order, so that the, the orientation and uh, size of the ductus are very much influenced by the flow patterns uh, uh, caused by various congenital heart defects. Now, what regulates the ductus arteriosus? And the, the mo most important things that regulate the ductus are oxygen, of course, prostaglandins. Nitric oxide has been shown recently to be a very important factor in influencing ductus arteriosus. And another important agent is adenosine. <coughs> now, the ductus arteriosus is constricted by oxygen. This is a study from a fetal lamb in which you see that the normal PO2 to which the ductus is exposed in utero is about 22. And you see that with an increase in PO2, the ductus constricts. It's interesting that with extreme hypoxemia, the ductus also constricts. But the response of the ductus, the constricted response of the ductus to oxygen, progressively increases with gestational age. So that here in, uh, in lambs, below about 90 days gestation, which is about 0.6 of gestation, you see that the ductus hardly constricts at all with oxygen. Whereas as you increasingly go towards term, there's a progressive increase in the sensitivity of the ductus to, to oxygen. Now, as far as, uh, incidentally, this uh, oxygen response is similar in the human fetus. The human fetus, the fetal ductus, responds very poorly to oxygen in an early gestation, and that partly explains why the uh, preterm uh, fetus, uh, preterm infant has... Uh, such a high incidence of uh, patency. It's not the only reason. Now, prostaglandins are actually produced in the ductus wall, and both PGE2 and PGE1 uh, and, uh, and PGI2 are produced. PGI2 is prostacyclin. But the response to PGE2 is tremendously greater, about more than 100 times greater than it is to PGI2, and it causes a relaxation of the ductus. PGE2 is also produced in the placenta, and circulating concentrations in the fetus are very high. And that is really mainly responsible for keeping the ductus open in the fetus. And if you block PGE2 production in the fetus, the ductus constricts. We know that from the use of non-steroidal agents in mothers, which causes the ductus to constrict in the fetus. Now, the, it's interesting that the response of the ductus to PGE and to uh, oxygen changes during gestation, so that, as I mentioned, the, the progressive increase in response to oxygen occurs during gestational advancement, but the response to PGE2 is much more prominent in earlier gestation than in late gestation. And this would make sense that you'd want the ductus to constrict after birth. Now, nitric oxide has recently been shown to have a very potent dilator effect on the ductus. We don't really know what the, the importance of the effect of nitric oxide versus prostaglandin E is. But what we do know is that if you inhibit nitric oxide synthesis, you can constrict the ductus. Now, this has been used at, in a trial in some preterm infants whose ductus did not constrict with, uh, uh, prost with uh, prostaglandin inhibition, with endomethacin. The problem is that the agents currently available for blocking nitric oxide synthesis are very toxic, so it's, it's no longer used anymore. It was just a trial that was used. And here, too, the ductus is more sensitive to nitric oxide than to PGE in earlier gestation. <coughs> 
Now, the question, we know that the ductus closes after birth. Obviously, it's not required after birth. Uh, one might ask, was, what is the value of having a ductus arteriosus before birth? Why shouldn't the blood just go through the pulmonary circulation, come back to the heart and be ejected? And we don't really have an answer to that, but one reasonable supposition is that what it does is it reduces the total workload on the heart because you have to get blood to the placenta and by allowing blood to go through the ductus to the descending aorta you avoid the extra load on the heart by having it come back to the left ventricle and be ejected to get to the placenta. So that's the, the, perhaps the main reason that the ductus is of value in the fetus. Now after birth, when does it close? Well, there's, again, not a great deal of information. There's one very nice study by Shiro Ishii in which he showed in a series of babies that studied by ultrasound that, that there's bidirectional flow through the ductus up to about seven hours after birth. And of course, this is still because pulmonary vascular resistance is still relatively high so that there may be some uh, uh, shunting through the ductus from right to left during early systole when the velocity of blood is high and some may go through the ductus. But he found that functional closure was present in about half within the first 24 hours and complete in all babies it was completely closed functionally within two days. Now, the interesting question that comes up, because it becomes a, a, a big problem in preterm infants, and unfortunately I don't have time to go into that in detail, but the problem in preterm infants is that the ductus tends to stay open a longer period. E even though it may constrict, it doesn't close permanently. So the question is, what are the factors which are responsible for permanent closure of the ductus? And Ron Kleiman has shown that it's very much dependent on actual damage to the ductus wall. He has shown that in the ductus of the full-term infant or animal, the supply, there is a, an oxygen supply to the wall of the, the outer wall of the ductus through the vasovasorum. The inner wall of the ductus gets its oxygen supply through the wall, through, through the lumen of the ductus. Now, when, when the ductus constricts, its wall thickens and flow re is reduced so the center of the ductus becomes hypoxic and he's shown that the PO2 drops to very low levels and this causes disruption, necrosis, and that causes permanent ductus closure. And that's usually complete within about 20 days after birth. Now in the preterm infant, the problem is that the ductus doesn't constrict. So it wall, its wall remains open, its wall is thinner anyhow, and so that there is no way in which the center portion of the ductus wall can become hypoxic. And that's why it doesn't develop permanent closure until it eventually does constrict. Now, what does a ductus do? Well, we know that a small ductus doesn't have much effect. A large ductus, the pulmonary arterial pressure remains elevated. The systolic pressure, with a large ductus, the systolic pressure is equal to aortic pressure, as it is in the fetus. And the diastolic pressure, though, varies because that depends on pulmonary vascular resistance. If pulmonary vascular resistance falls, pulmonary, ar di pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure will fall even though systolic pressure remains elevated at systemic levels. And with a moderate sized ductus, it's sort of in between. Now, the 
One important question is what influences shunt through the ductus. Because we know during fetal life, the flow is exclusively from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. So what happens after birth? Now, of course, that's because in the fetus, pulmonary vascular resistance is high. And placental vascular resistance is relatively low. So that blood preferentially flows away from the lungs through the ductus into the descending aorta. After birth, when the main factor that determines shunting through the ductus is what happens to pulmonary vascular resistance. If pulmonary vascular resistance stays high, then shunting through the ductus continues to be right to left. And we see that in babies who have lung disease, where they have right to left shunting, they do not develop left to right shunting. We'll talk about the premature in a moment. It also happens at altitude where the left to right shunt is much less than in the baby born at sea level because pulmonary vascular resistance stays relatively elevated because of the low PO2 in the, in the environment. And you can see that quite in high altitude places like in Cerro del Pasco in Peru, where these babies do not develop much left to right shunt at all because they, the, duct, the ductus stays open but doesn't develop left to right shunts. It has right to left shunting. And um, so that with a large ductus, the, uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance tends to remain elevated because uh, somewhat and therefore left to right shunt takes a long time to develop after birth uh, uh, in the mature infant. Now in the preterm infant, pulmonary vascular resistance falls more rapidly after birth than in the mature infant, unless there is pulmonary disease. But otherwise the pulmonary vascular resistance falls more rapidly. And that's why preterm infants develop a very early left to right shunt after birth. Okay, so what, you know, we, we worry mainly about uh, the effects of the shunt on cardiac failure because what happens with uh, uh, a shunt is that the extra volume returns to the left ventricle, places a volume load on the left ventricle, and left ventricular failure may develop. Now, this is an, uh, one factor, but another important factor that we have to recognize is that as shunt develops, the volume of blood that has to be ejected by this ventricle increases enormously in order for it to maintain systemic blood flow. Now, in studies that Dr. Kleiman has done in newborn lambs, uh, preterm newborn lambs, he has shown that the, uh, when the, the lamb is born, that the left to right shunt develops very quickly. Volume of uh, ejected by the left ventricle it increases very rapidly. And flow to peripheral organs falls because the left ventricle is unable to sustain an output which, could, which will accommodate both systemic blood flow and pulmonary blood flow. So output falls to organs such as the brain, the heart, kidneys, various other organs. And that's what also happens in preterm infants when they develop a very, very large shunt, they develop decreased flow to peripheral organs. The other important point that may arise is because of the fact that diastolic pressure in the aorta falls because of the shunt through the pulmonary circulation, is some the question has been raised about whether coronary blood flow is maintained because flow into the coronary circulation is predominantly during diastole. Now, we get to this issue which um, Dr. Sanders was talking about, closure of the ductus. And I think we have to have a very important point raised 
about when should a ductus be closed. Now we have no problem with a preterm infant uh, where it causes problems, although recently there's begun to be some question about whether closing the ductus in the preterm infant is absolutely necessary. Some studies have shown that there's no difference in survival or incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia in babies who have not had their ductus closed as compared <coughs> to babies who have. But the, the, the point I want to really concentrate on in regard to ductus closure is on the small ductus. Now, if you look at the incidence of patent ductus arteriosus in adolescents and adults, there's been a tremendous increase in its incidence because there are a large number of so-called silent ductuses where you don't hear the ductus, but when you study with, by ultrasound, you find a small ductus. And the question has been now raised whether these ductuses should be closed. And in fact, if you look at the incidence of uh, ductus uh, with the silent ductus, it's probably up to about 0.1 to 0.2% of the total population. So it's a substantial number of people and if we are closing them, we have to ask the question, why, why are we closing them? And secondly, if we are closing them, uh, should we do ultrasound on the whole population to see if they have a ductus because it's such a common problem? And the main issue is that in the population of patients with ductus, we know that ductus causes failure early in infancy. If it's a large ductus, it may cause pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease. But what about the others? What happens to them? And in fact, if you look at the natural history, none of these patients get into trouble. The main concern that we've had in the past is the incidence of, sub of infective endocarditis. But there are two large studies, one done in Europe and one done in Great Britain, I guess that's part of Europe, <laughs> uh, Great Britain, in which they showed that the incidence of, P of infective endocarditis with ductus arteriosus is exceedingly small really small. So it raises an interesting question, you know, now with the device closure, uh, we have pediatric cardiologists closing everything that, where there's a, an opening between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and the question is, is that necessary? Thank you. I'm, I'm certainly pleased that uh, Dr. Rudolph discussed the question of, um, of when to close a ductus or whether to close it. Um, um, so um, my, my task is going to be a lot simpler because uh, what I'm really asked to do is, is there a ductus, yes or no? Um, and uh, uh, certainly in the neonate, that's a problem. People are not asking me whether that fundamental question is what to do about it. And I think that that's still the most important issue. And I think you brought this out very clearly. I am, have been motivated uh, to reconsider ductus arteriosus in the light of the findings of Bill Bennett's from Stanford, who did a study which showed that, in fact, that the ductus didn't really change the morbidity and mortality uh, of the patients under his care. And he did a meta-analysis which showed that that was the case. And uh, Dr. Rudolph and I have discussed this because I learned everything I know about the ductus from Dr. Rudolph. But um, there's another study that comes out of Canada from uh, Mark uh, Friedberg's institution. I can see him 
pulling out his hair about. Uh, his neonatologists who um, have also considered, in fact, that perhaps uh, the closure of the ductus is um, a big, uh, probably overdone in our society. And I think probably it has been, and certainly treatment has been overdone uh, because now endomethacin is uh, uh, easy to give to, to babies and you don't have to make that same critical decision about treatment uh, that we made uh, in, in years gone by about the ductus. But I still remember uh, looking after patients with patent ductus and uh, uh, hyaline membrane disease where the patients recovered from the hyaline membrane disease but I think uh, I'm talking about uh, when I was an intern in the uh, 1960s, uh, where the fifth, those uh, babies then went on to die from uh, acute heart failure from large patent ductus arteriosus. So I still think that it's an important issue. I don't know all of the answers to that, but uh, it's certainly something worthwhile considering. So uh, let me uh, just uh, start by uh, rem reminding you where the ductus comes from. It comes from the sixth aortic arch, the lateral extension of the sixth aortic arch, usually on the left side, but it can occur on the right side when, uh, on the, um, on the right side when uh, there's a right aortic arch. And there are two ductus arteriosi in, uh, in the fetus. Um, when I saw these original pictures, I thought that uh, my days as an ultrasonographer were over. Uh, because the pictures were of such exquisite quality. And this actually landed up what it was, as this was a rat uh, fetus um, by Kazuo Mama's group. And uh, what he did is he did an experiment to give um, uh, endomethacin to pregnant mothers and watch the closure of the uh, ductus arteriosus uh, in the womb of the rat. Um, virtually wiped out the rat population in Japan doing the study. But uh, in, in any event, uh, you can see here the uh, constriction of the ductus uh, here uh, and complete closure uh, of the ductus uh, at the end. This three and four are wrongly termed. And I put this out in this particular bizarre uh, presentation because I try to compare it to what we see uh, echocardiographically. So where is the ductus? Uh, well, we define the ductus of the period after the bifurcation of the um, pulmonary arteries to the junction of where the, um, this tube enters uh, the descending aorta. It's uh, much easier uh, in the fetus to see that. There it is in a fetus. Here's the subclavian coming in. So the ductus is after the bifurcation, and it's got a length as well as a caliber. Um, now, this is a work uh, that uh, Ron Kleiman frequently cited about how the ductus closes. Uh, the ductus uh, develops these um, uh, nests in the intima uh, and also uh, uh, cytolytic uh, uh, necrosis in the media as well as constriction. And uh, finally, the ductus looks something like this. There's often a lumen present within the ligamentum arteriosum that you can see histologically. Um, and um, uh, so you can see the progressive stages of the ductus closure uh, that occur uh, in, uh, histologically. Now, so what we want to do uh, with uh, looking at the ductus in the premature infant on, and the neonate is document the size of the ductus uh, by imaging and by color, uh, look at the ductus diameter, and uh, for this we use... Um, the, um, the size of the left pulmonary artery. If the aorta is, uh, if the ductus is bigger than the pulmonary artery, then that's a big ductus. If it's not quite as big, but bigger than half, it's a moderate sized ductus. And if it's less than half the size of the left pulmonary artery, it's a small ductus. So we can document the size, uh, the ductus diameter. We can look at PISA, PISA stands for Proximal Isovelocity Surface Acceleration. I mentioned it in the Color Flow talk. I'll show you some more examples. And when you have a small shunt, it's small. When you have a moderate size shunt, the PISA is moderate. And when it's a very large ductus, of course, then there's no constriction, so there's no PISA at all. 
and I'll show you examples of that. We look at retrograde abdominal aortic flow. Now, there's a little secret here. It's called blood pressure monitoring. But uh, people don't usually measure that um, very carefully anymore. I've noticed, uh, you know, people look at mean arterial pressures, but what we want to look at is pulse pressure. And, of course, that's very important. And the, um, the um, retrograde abdominal flow that you can see in uh, a standard neonate is certainly a reflection of the pulse pressure and the runoff that you can see from the ductus. And um, so I'll show you the examples. If there's prograde flow, then there's mild ductus. If there's no flow, then it's moderate. And if there's retrograde flow with reversal, then it's large. And the vet if you do velocity time integrals, which is the integral of the forward flow versus the retrograde flow, if that's one to one, you really have a very large ductus. And then we can also look at the, doctor, the ductus by Doppler. And as Dr. Rudolf mentioned, of course, uh, when the ductus constricts and the pulmonary artery pressure falls, then the velocity goes up. But when we're talking about small premature inference, when we talk about the blood pressures where they're very low, you don't want to look for very high velocities. You may have only 2 meters or 16 millimeters of mercury gradient. So that becomes an important issue. So if you calculate this as 1, 2, 3, four, five, six, uh, uh, and the L, of course, the LAA ratio and the size of the hemodynamic uh, contraction of the left ventricle is still the standard for looking at, um, at um, the size of the ductus. Um, so let's look at some of those. So here's an example of looking at the aorta by color flow. And here is a small or moderate sized ductus. And you can see here the red flow is going in the right direction. And then at this point here where the yellow is seen here, that's at 64 centimeters per second. And that is the boundary of the alias here. And the radius is the difference between that boundary and the narrowest part of the ductus here. Uh, here is a large ductus. And of course, you can see there is no pisa in that ductus at all. There's just red flow because the ductus is not constricted. And here's a very tiny ductus. Uh, in addition to talking about PISA, we can also look at this area over here of a jet, which is called the vena contractor. The vena contractor is the narrowest point of a jet. That's somewhat smaller than the narrowest orifice of the, of the valve, but it's a reasonable indicator of the size of the ductus. And so here you can see the ductus size. You can also see the size relative to the size of the left pulmonary artery, which is seen in this ductus cut, which if you do a, a pediatric echo, uh, uh, you place the transducer on the left side in a sort of straight upward and downward direction and look for the uh, descending uh, thoracic spine, and uh, then the aorta will run just in front of that. So you can see uh, very nicely um, the... Um, the, how this is an oriented in a straight upward and downward direction. And this one is obtained high up through the suprasternal notch. And uh, this one, most more uh, precordial orientation. So here's Pisa, and here's the example of what happens in a jet. Uh, and here you see all of the uh, red cells lining up, trying to get through this little small orifice. And then when they reach the certain level, then they reach a level of aliasing, which is at this point over here. Red flow is in the first direction. There's the aliasing point and then the radius here, and you can calculate the actual flow across the ductus. The only problem with this is that it's uh, not a very accurate calculation, uh, uh, unfortunately. So here's, here's a large ductus, a still frame in a large ductus, and again, here there is no evidence of Pisa, and you can see the ductus diameter compared to the left pulmonary artery right next to it is quite substantially uh, larger. So this is one a large ductus. And if we look in the abdominal aorta from below here, this is a subcostal uh, a, a sagittal image. Here runs the descending aorta. Here's the diaphragm. And just at the level of the diaphragm, we see prograde flow, and then we see retrograde flow. And if you do a velocity time integral on this, Clearly, the prograde flow is larger than the retrograde flow, but it's not larger by much. So this is a substantial ductus. And when you look at the flow in the ductus, you can see prograde flow in systole right to left and largely in diastole left to right across this small ductus arteriosus.
So this is that so-called ductus cut that we were looking at. And you see here the ductus. You can see by color flow that the ductus is somewhat smaller than the origin of the left pulmonary artery. Okay. And here's another example. You can see the spinous, uh, the spinal bodies running here just in front of the descending aorta. So that gives you an indication that you're looking at something in a virtually uh, a straight up and down uh, orientation. Okay, you can also see the large pulmonary blood flow coming back to the left atrium here and the large left atrium. Now here's a small ductus. And here you can see that the vena contractor is pretty close to zero. And if you look at the size of the PISA here, I didn't have the scale on here, but um, the scale um, here is about uh, 50 centimeters per second, a very small PISA, so a very small ductus, and that's from the ductus cut. Now, often in the neonate who is uh, sick because of respiratory distress, there is hyperventilation. And then the only place that you have as an access for doing the ultrasound study is from the subcostal region through the tendon of the diaphragm where there's no lung. And here is such an example. And here you can see again, uh, this is left ventricle, right ventricle. This is front and back. And here is the um, pulmonary artery here. There's the left pulmonary artery. And here's the ductus here. And you can see that the ductus has got length from the descending aorta, which is at this end here, and there's constriction at the pulmonary end of the ductus. Okay, there's another tiny ductus over here, and again, um, I think that color flow has certainly saved our, um, um, our hides in uh, many circumstances because we can uh, see something that really uh, gives us a, a greater understanding of the volume of flow through the ductus. You see a very nice PISA here, though even though this is a small ductus, there's still a fairly large amount of flow through here. And when you think of the size of this baby, I mean, this is one centimeter, so one, two, three, four centimeters, we're already in the chest, this is a, a small premature infant. So a one to two millimeter ductus is not an insignificant ductus in that size infant. Okay, and that's again a much smaller ductus in a much larger infant. So the ductus closes. We've heard how it closes. Now, um, it's described usually that the ductus usually starts closing on the pulmonary end, then it closes in the middle, and lastly, it closes on the aortic side. And that's true most of the time, but it's not true all of the time. Sometimes it closes in the middle, and really it closes on the aortic side. And what you see on this, sorry, let me just go back one. What you see on this aortic side here is uh, here is the ductus open still at the aortic end here yeah, with this uh, looking almost like a bird's beak over here. We call this a beak. Um, and uh, this is not to be confused with an area of coarctation where the constriction is opposite the ductus and usually on the posterior wall. Okay. Okay, so now uh, Dr. Sanders reported patients by Gus Mavrudis who trained in San Francisco where this study was obtained. And um, as you can see, not all surgical results, I'm afraid, Steve, uh, seem to have the success with which uh, Dr. Mavrudis quoted them because here's a patient who has a lig ligament on the ductus and, of course, it hasn't closed the ductus. There's still a residual defect. So, uh, again, I will tell you that this echocardiogram uh, was uh, generated in uh, between uh, 1983 uh, uh, and 85. So it is fairly old, and in the old days, uh, before many of you were born, uh, they used to use a ligature to close the ductus. Now they use the metal staples, so uh, that works a lot better, but not always perfectly as well. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, you are going to see patients that have got residual problems even after surgery. And here is another example of a patient that came um, from across town in San Francisco where the uh, general surgeons do ductus ligations. And the doctor was distressed that even after a ductus ligation, there was a fairly substantial ductus left to right shunt in this patient. And what happened was that the surgeon uh, working in that little hole there wasn't quite as skilled as we would have liked um, her to have been. And uh, she ligated the left bronchus by mistake. 
Uh, so the patient came, got a ductus ligation, and then had a bronchoscopy to dilate, take the clip off and dilate the left bronchus. Uh, so a lot of morbidity from that. And here's the, the x-ray that came with the patient, and you can see that there's a whiteout of the left lung, and there's the uh, ligature clearly placed quite appropriately on the, the left bronchus. So anyway, I'll just show you that uh, any mistakes happen even in our institution. All right, so another evaluation of size. We look at, uh, as Mark had explained, uh, the ventricle gets uh, very hyperactive and contracts very well. So you see a much bigger ventricle with higher Z scores than you would expect to find. And then the aortic size um, compared to the size of the left atrium uh, is increased. The left atrium uh, is always large, and in fact, um, I still remember when I presented the first data that Dr. Rene Sillia asked about, well, what about the ductus left to right shunt? Because even uh, when, the when the atrium enlarges, even if the um, foramen is closed, when it enlarges, sometimes it stretches and you get a left to right shunt at atrial level as well. But it's because the atrium is dilated that that happens. So... Here's a, an example of a very large ductus. Uh, we'll talk about this in a moment, but there's the normal orientation of the ductus in a horizontal plane here. And you can see the flow dynamics here. There is um, a, a, a left to right shunt. If we look in the proximal aorta, then we can see prograde diastolic flow because the prograde diastolic flow is caused by the left to right shunt component from the ascending aorta that goes into the ductus. If you get in the middle of the ductus or in the descending aorta, then you see retrograde flow. So there's a steel into the ductus, both from the, pro, from the cranial as well as from the cordial direction. And again here, we can just look at the size of the duct compared to the left pulmonary artery and have an assessment that this is a very large uh, patent ductus arteriosus. And now here we are looking at uh, the abdominal aortic signal and... You could call this a normal abdominal aortic signal. In the normal abdominal aortic signal, there's always a tidal wave of prograde diastolic flow as the aorta constricts off. Now, as the ductus shunt starts to increase, this drops off, okay, and eventually reaches baseline, or then as the shunt gets larger and larger, uh, it forms a larger and larger retrograde flow in diastole. I tried to, to establish a, a five-point system like a, um, a, um, an APGAR score for a ductus. And it works reasonably, but it's not great. So we, we still can't put that into practice yet. But here's an example of the ductus velocities. So here's a patient with a small ductus. These are all small premature infants. And so you can see a fairly high, about two and a half meter per second velocity across the ductus, which suggests a 25 millimeter pressure difference, mean pressure difference between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, a restrictive ductus. And then I've matched these up by comparison as the, uh, the uh, ductus gets less restrictive and the flow gets larger left to right, you see eventually um, bidirectional flow across the ductus from a continuous flow to uh, less continuous flow to sometimes looks almost like there's a stoppage of flow in diastole to um, um, diastolic, um, um, to systolic left to right shunting with very, very low velocity signal. This is a pulse Doppler uh, signal. Well, the ductus is a nice subject when you look at it alone, but it comes with everything else. So here is a patient with a, a co-octation of the aorta, and this has become a nightmare for us in America because uh, people will diagnose a co-octation, and then they put the patient on prostaglandin, and then they don't send you the echocardiogram, and you look at the patient and you can't actually find a co-octation as we show in this patient. And... Uh, when he's off PGE, there's clearly a, um, a contract constriction at the level of the, the ductus. But when you um, put the patient on prostaglandin, you can't actually find that. So this is a new iatrogenic disease that we see. Now, Dr. Rudolph, uh, in his early work, looked at the orientation of the ductus as an example of flow dynamics that occur um, across 
uh, the ductus. And here is a patient who has a normal orientation of the ductus. So the ductus almost is a continuation of the palmary arch into the descending aorta. If you've ever seen um, the, these arches on three-dimensional fetal echocardiogram, the arch is a perfectly straight thing. Now here's a patient who has palmary atresia, in which case there is no flow into the palmary arteries and there's larger amounts of isthmic flow and then the ductus becomes a much more vertically than a horizontally oriented structure. And uh, these two examples are from my textbook, which is no longer available. Um, and um, you can see here exactly the same vertical versus the normal orientation of the ductus, indicating uh, the examples of what happened in, uh, in, in fetal life. Here again is another ductus uh, with coarctation. This patient was not on prostaglandin, and you can see uh, very nicely how uh, the ductus uh, is present uh, in this patient with a tapering of the aortic arch uh, in the region of, of the ductus, a juxtaductal coarctation, which eventually, when the ductus closes, uh, produce a more profound amount of constriction. And you can see the folding in of the posterior shelf on the, the anatomical specimen over here. Well, ductuses may be that uh, boring, but I, I think they become a much more interesting subject. Here's a patient with a right aortic arch. I always orient the aortic arch as if I was looking at a coronal plane. So here is a right aortic arch, and here is the left innominate artery, and off the base of the left innominate artery is this ductus the left-sided ductus with the right aortic arch. But also on the right aortic arch, there's a right ductus. So they're bilateral ductus arteriosa in this patient. And here they are proven on the angiogram. They're the two pulmonary arteries. And there's no a central pulmonary artery in this patient. And here's a close-up magnification of that. There's the right ductus of the right arch. And there's the left ductus of the innominate vessel, which is the base, uh, or is the analogue of the left aortic arch. And uh, here again is the angiogram showing the aortic arch with the uh, right aortic arch here, and then the ductus coming off the base of the aortic arch on this side. Here's the innominate vessel here, and here is the flow into the left pulmonary artery. And notice when the bilateral ductus arteriosa, that frequently there is no central pulmonary artery. Okay. Well, you can get a right ductus of the left arch, you can get a right ductus of the right arch, you can get a left ductus of the left arch, and you can get a left ductus uh, of the anomalous uh, artery on the right side. So all of those things are possible, and we have the potential to look at all of these things. And I, I know Dr. Sanders is going to come up a little later and talk about aortic arches and vascular rings. And I'm sure he's going to have some beautiful examples of uh, the ductus in these situations as well. Now, ductus aneurysms. A lot has been made of ductus aneurysms. You can find these in uh, postnatally. Uh, uh, in, in prenatally, you see them quite commonly. Uh, but uh, when after birth, they usually go away. A lot has been made of them that they may be associated with Marfan syndrome and they may go on to rupture. I've never seen that example, and most of the time you see this huge ductus aneurysm here, and with, you have to come quickly to do the echocardiogram because if you don't do it uh, very soon, uh, you, um, you will lose uh, the, the, duck, uh, the, the opportunity to make these findings. So I'll show you a few more ductus aneurysms. And here you see, start to see clot developing in the ductus. Here you can see there's almost no flow already at this time. Here's the pulmonary artery. And, and this is a, a mag view up at the ductus aneurysm, which uh, usually uh, disappears. OK. now. I mean, ductuses could stop over at that point, but uh, we have to look. Uh, this is a work now because of the use of the ductus devices and occlusive. 
we have to see what, we, uh, what the pulmonary arteries look like. And this is very important to be able to see the branch pulmonary arteries, and I'll show you why and measure them. Uh, this was given to me from uh, the uh, group uh, that, uh, that does the studies of uh, the control group. And you can see here that the ductus not only has a length to it, but it also has a different tapering caliper. And these obviously are parts of the consideration that need to be made in terms of putting in a device. This is perfect for a device because you see how this long ductus tapers towards the pulmonary artery end. And here is an example of a device which has been placed across the ductus. Uh, here's the right and the left pulmonary artery. And you can see the device jumping up very nicely and beautifully situated within the ductus. And here you see the device actually looks like it's encroaching on the pulmonary artery. But remember, we're looking at a three-dimensional structure and the ductus is somewhat superior to the origin of the left pulmonary artery. This seems to be a problem, uh, but not a significant one. And it appears to have, be associated with some mild acceleration in the pulmonary artery, but with remolding, this seems not to be uh, a problem. The ductus obviously is very important in interrupted aortic arch, and here is an example of such. And uh, we watch the coils and so on and so forth. We sometimes use contrast echocardiographies, particularly in pulmonary hypertension, when there's a ductus. And here's saline injected into the right side of the heart. And of course, you can see that there's flow into the ductus here. You can see the flow coming across the ductus and into the descending aorta, indicating a right to left shunt. And here is another example with color of a patient with pulmonary hypertension and a constricted ductus with a shunt going right to left, and of course, suprasystemic pulmonary artery pressures as a consequence. So I finished on time. Thank you, Matthias. Um, we're going to go for lunch now. Matthias is going to make some announcements. I just want to say one thing to you. I'm going to stand at the door, and I'm going to ask, uh, as you pass me, to tell me if there's anything that you didn't like this morning so that we can try and modify the course for your benefit and also for future people that come here. What do you want to do? Your stick. That's my stick. Okay. I need to show a picture. Okay, so just hang on a minute. Uh, your stick is there. Morning. Okay. Perfect. So the main question is how you find something to eat. I can make it bigger for you if you want. Can you make it bigger? No. Do you see something up there? Yeah. So we are... Oh. Yeah, very good. So we are here.